Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Revealed. Uh, last week, if you tuned into the live segment we did a few days after this episode aired, um, appreciate you joining in. It was a lot of fun. We got a ton of questions. So if you want to kind of continue that trend, make sure you leave us a question down below and maybe we'll do it again this week. Uh, check back in with any one of our Instagram accounts to see if we are going to go live and uh, if so, at what time. So jumping right back into it, last week we kind of left you off with this box and at that time there was no end panels on it. So since then we have gotten all of the end panels veneered and we started actually miter wrapping um, the corners for the returns so that they do properly overlay the cases. Now one of the reasons that we're doing that is this door is going to be a full overlay door, but if you remember from last week, the poles for the doors as well as the drawers have an integrated mitered finger pole. So we don't want to be able to see into the cabinet when we're looking straight on at the door. So we have these wider returned poles so that it blocks any visibility into that cabinet. This panel here is the far left side. This will actually line up with the unit above it on the second floor. If you remember from some of the other videos that we've shown you or through Nick's site visit, you can actually see both the first floor and the second floor at the same time, giving us this great line of sight. If you loop around here, you can see the second end panel also returns back, giving us a consistent look across the two pieces. And we're actually going to have a full back panel here as well as covering this bench. Now, if you come over here, you can actually see this here is that back panel. We also have a mitered return on this. That's because the side that's going to butt up against the wall gets this 3 8 by 3 8 shadow gap detail, as well as this side here. They're not cut in just yet. We actually caught the guys on their lunch break, so they are in the middle of processing all of these parts that we're talking about. For our mitre wraps, this is actually one of the biggest questions we get. How are we doing it? Well, to achieve this, all we're doing is taking our flat sheet good, setting our saw blade to 45. Now you wanna make sure that you are double checking this with either your combination square or digital angle gauge. We kinda of use both here depending on who's actually doing the setup and their personal preference. Once you have that, you just cut a miter on each side. You can use a number of different methods here to join this. We like to just use some packing tape. So if you come in close, you can actually take a look here. You can see that this corner has packing tape going down the whole way. We like to use the clear tape because it allows us to see that seam and to see if there's any gaps or openings uh, in that miter. Now, once we get that miter folded over, we wanna keep it clamped up at 90, and that's where the blue tape comes in. And the reason we switch over to blue tape is it is just a little bit easier to break apart. You don't have to cut it with the razor knife. You can just rip it with your hand. It makes that process a little bit faster and easier. And we're just making sure to clamp this over and kind of pull it back to make sure that we are 90 degrees from one face to the other. Now, over on the bench here, we actually have what's going to be the bench top for this entryway unit. Now this piece here also miters across the front. That way again, so when you're looking down through that mitered pole, you don't see inside the cabinet. We have sufficient coverage that you aren't going to see in there. So this panel comes across the top of the bench and then gets mitered somewhere, I'm assuming this line, like I said, they're right in the middle of working on this. They're gonna come back and miter this panel to give us that return on the side of the bench so that when you are looking at this unit, right when you walk in the door, everything matches. On top of this unit, they are gonna put um, an upholstered cushion just to make it a little bit more comfortable when you are sitting on there and to add um, a little bit of texture and another element to the design. So coming back over to the unit, the architect actually specced out using the Bloom Legra box drawers. These aren't drawers that we actually use all that often. 
but they are actually incredibly smooth and fairly easy to install and set up. As we are down over here in this area, you can kind of see that this end panel isn't pushed tight up against our case. And that's because we have all of our cross pieces are still run a little bit long. We're in the process of assembling this now. So in a little bit here, we're gonna go back, trim those pieces to size so that we can slide this end panel all the way back into place. If you caught our video from last week, you'll remember that this entire unit floats six inches off the ground. So we're gonna have some steel brackets in the walls, which James put in last week. And we have two in the cabinet portion. And then we have three in the bench portion. This is just to make sure that the entire unit is supported and so that there's plenty of support when somebody is sitting on there. So a lot of this miter work is done on our sliding table saw, which is actually one of the tools that we get the most questions about. So this is a saw that we use very frequently in our shop. And I wanted to dig into it a little bit deeper and show you some of the additional features. In the last episode where we covered tools, we kind of gave you the general run through of its capabilities as far as how to process sheet goods and what um, other options there are for saws like this. But I wanna dig a little bit deeper into what this saw can actually do. So this particular saw has a 10 and a half foot travel. So what that actually means is that we can put a 10 foot long sheet of plywood or MDF, any kind of sheet good on here, and it will travel past our blade by several inches. So that's usually why they have the extra six inches on there is to make sure that you can kind of clear your blade. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, these do come in different sizes. So in general, when you are using these saws, you want to make sure obviously that you're going to start behind your blade. Occasionally it does become tricky where maybe you lose kind of sight of where you're at, but you really want to make sure you're not going to hit that piece um, before you're ready to set up that could cause injury to you and also damage to the actual piece. Now, if you come around the other side, I'll show you probably one of the greatest features of this saw. And we use it in this shop a lot. That's this here scoring blade. So first thing right off the bat, you're gonna notice that the teeth of this blade are going in the opposite direction of that blade. It's actually used to score things like the veneer or the first layer of that sheet good. This prevents chipping or tear out when processing sheet goods. Um, this is especially important when you're dealing with things that are going to be seen on two sides where you can't afford to get any of that tear out, things like shelves. So typically your saw blade is going to spin towards you. This allows you to push your piece through that blade and when that blade does come around it basically just pushes right out that bottom edge, right? So that's where you get that tear out, the damage in that graining. This is more so on cross cuts than um, a rip cut as with the rips you are going with the grain so you're getting less tear out there. Now what the scoring blade does is it spins the opposite way and you make very shallow cuts with this usually just through the layer of veneer maybe sometimes a little bit deeper. Like I just showed you when you do start with your fence back a little bit further you need to actually make sure you're not just behind this blade that you're also behind this blade. That can get a little bit tricky or confusing especially if you're just in the mindset of using um, your main blade here. If you catch this blade a little bit too soon and you aren't quite ready for it, it can kind of propel you into the main blade, which again can cause serious injury to yourself or your workpiece. So be aware and pay attention when you are using that scoring blade. This particular saw here, we can actually fit a 14 inch blade on here. It actually gives us a lot of extra cutting height. So when we're dealing with things like larger glue ups, like thick shelves or thick end panels, we have that height to cut through that piece all in one pass. This saw will cut miters um, just as a standard table saw. You can crank it anywhere from 90 to 45. This will also turn your scoring blade. So you can use the scoring blade when you are cutting a miter. Now, another thing to be aware of when using the scoring blade is what side of the fence you're on. So typically the scoring blades are two pieces and you are able to adjust them according to the width of your main blade. And we're not always using the scoring blade, so we just make sure to pay attention to which side of the blade it's on. If we're using the scoring blade with our rip fence, we wanna make sure that the rip side of both blades are aligned, or if we're using the crosscut fence, we wanna make sure that the crosscut side of both blades are aligned. These are just micro adjustments on the knobs in the front of the saw here, and most saws like this have a scoring blade and the adjustments are relatively similar. 
Saws like these also have a fair rip capacity. Um, generally, you're probably not using something this wide on this side of the fence. You're kind of coming over here and you're gonna, and you're not usually going to use this fence and your crosscut fence at the same time. That can cause some serious injury, right? With things binding. So if you are using the two, you wanna make sure to pull your actual fence back beyond the apex of that blade. Another nice feature about these saws is they have this over the Arbor dust hood. We actually have it off at the moment. It's actually not something that we use that often, but it is very nice to have. It does a little bit better job with collecting the dust. When you are processing larger sheet goods and you're gonna hang over on the crosscut section, they do have this bar here that is adjustable to help support the load of your sheet good. Now, you can kind of push it out of the way if you find that it's getting in your way. It also has several different um, setup positions on here. So you could put it at an angle, either way, uh, whatever works best to support that piece. Everything on these saws are completely micro adjustable. So on the back side here, we have several adjustments to make sure that this fence is square with our blade. And then same thing on our rip fence. And this crosscut fence can actually pivot in either direction to help make it easier for you to cut different angles. And uh, comes with a couple different clamp down supports. You know, oftentimes when you are cutting larger sheets, you can't be on this end clamping down as well as pushing from down here. So it has the clamp up in the front and it also has a clamp down here at the tail. Now that these guys are back from lunch, they are going to need to kick me out of here so they can get back to work. As always, appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. Leave us some comments and of course, subscribe. Thanks, we'll see you next week. Give you, I don't know what I'm saying, I'm losing it, Doug. I am the bean wizard. This entire thing. Hey, welcome to, can you hear that? So that it blocks the gap there. That doesn't sound right. And when somebody is sitting on there, there is paying attention when you, on this saw. So, uh, oops, wrong. Maybe we don't do that. This also, the varying degrees. Say you're the bean wizard. Say you're the bean wizard.